Yeah, it's on. Good morning, everybody. Let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful Sunday and the perfect weather you've given us, Lord. Um, Amen. Let us sing with praise to you and your glor- your gloriousness and uh, your loving kindness, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. First song is going to be number 505, <coughs> Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply strained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul best songs. Faithful loving service to, to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his wolf will bay. He, your savior, wants to be to be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Yeah, go ahead. We'll do the next song. Go to the next song. Okay. I'm just going to help you out with it. <laughs> next song is going to be number 499, Sunshine in My Soul. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than grows in sky for Jesus is my light oh there's sunshine blessed sunshine when the peaceful happy moments roll when Jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in my soul there is music in my soul today, a carol to my King. And Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today, for when this is near, the 
dove of peace is in my heart. The flowers of grace appear. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and love and peace. For blessings to which he gives me now, for joy and future days. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. All right, All right good singing, y'all. That's not a song that we're that familiar with, but uh, sunshine in my soul. I hope that's true of you today. Uh, we've had some sunshine after, it seemed like we had two or three weeks of like not that much sun, which is not right for the you know, this kind of area of the country. But it, it seems like it's um nice week. We had that one day of wind that <laughs> forgot about that it could blow in Bullhead. It's been so windless this year. And then yesterday was just beautiful. And and fri- Friday was beautiful, just uh, sunny and, and warming up. So that was really nice. A little, little bit cool, but really nice here in the valley. I hope you're having a good Sunday morning. Uh, let's take a look at our bulletin. There's a couple of things I want to point out. Um, so we'll have our Wednesday service on February 1st. On Wednesday, y'all are uh, welcome to join us. We start at 7. You have to be a member of our group chat, so just you can just request that. If you have a Facebook account, you can join in with us. And then on February 11th, right, Sarah? It's not the 13th. It's February 11th. Um, we are having our Scooters Miniature Golf Tournament for Valentine's. And I, Maddie just told me she's not that good at miniature golf, so I'm thinking I can, Sarah and I can at least, oh, you got it. Okay, you got it. So, so I'm thinking we can avoid last place like we have gotten many times before. But, uh, <laughs> I, well, so much for that idea. So um, anyway, we have, we have a lot of fun. And you don't have to play, you don't have to play with, you can play with anybody. Like, we could just, we could just pair up and just like, Maybe we could seed everybody and do it that way. Then I have a better chance of winning. <laughs> or I don't know. So uh, you can play, play with whoever you want. It's just a fun time. It's a Valentine's get-together, but we try and just put the emphasis on the love of Christ and remembering all that he's done for us. And it's a great time to invite friends, family members. Uh, always share the gospel at our get-together. At Casa Serrano this time, we used to meet at El Plaza, but it's gone. So um, we're, we've been doing this for like 15 years. But this week, it'll be at Casa Serrano. At least we hope to. I'll let you know if there's any uh, change to that. So anyway, those are our announcements for this week. So the apologetics moment. Here we go. Here it is. <clears throat> so the night of your weekly Bible study group, during the discussion of the Sunday Sermon on the Great Commission, a newcomer's marks. Who are we to say Christianity is better than any other religion? I don't know if I've shared this, but it's okay to hear it again. I think the essence of Jesus' teaching is love, the same as all religions. It's not our job to tell other people how to live or believe. The rest of the group fidgets awkwardly but says nothing. How do you respond? Because, you know, that's a legitimate question that people have. And so on the other side is the answer. Christianity is basically the same as all other religions. The main similarity is love. We shouldn't tell others how to live or believe. So that's, the, that's a, a summary of the response. How much have you studied? So this is the questions that you can ask people. Not to be in their face. Not to say, oh, what are you talking about? Jesus is the only way. I mean, we could act like that, couldn't we? Just like fire right at him. Wait a minute. How could you say that? Jesus is the only way. The Bible is the only book. It's the only book that's verified, which is true, but you wouldn't like, you know, stab them with that. Instead, you'd say, how much have you studied other religions to compare the details and find a common theme? Because when you do that, you're going to find some real inconsistencies about 
what love is and and um, God's love compared to other religions. Like take Islam. It's a whole different thing. They don't talk about Islam's love. You never, have you ever heard that before? The love of Islam. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to avoid the judgment from Islam. And not that they can't be loving. And we have, I have lots of, I have many Islamic friends. I've had students that were Islamic that are loving people. They really are. But it's, it doesn't come from their understanding of the love of Islam. They would never say that. That's not part of their thing. Uh, and then what about the love of Buddha? Nobody ever says that, do they? Buddha's this far off, you know, impersonal, you know, part of the, you know, whatever, out there kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, those are, you probably don't want to like, if that's, if you're talking to someone, like you may not want to say that. But those, those are truths in your mind you'd be thinking of. Why would the similarities be more important than the differences? I'm curious, what do you think, Jesus' attitude was on this issue. You know, what did Jesus teach about this? About how all religions are the same and all teach the same love? Well, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know, Come to me. He didn't say, oh yeah, go to all these other religions. You know, uh, Did he think all religions were basically equal? Isn't telling people to love one another just another example of doing what you're objecting to? Telling others how they should live and believe. So those are some really good questions to think of. You know, you don't, you know, uh, we don't get very far if we come at our witnessing in an edgy, uh, argumentative way. It's so, you're much, so much more effective if you can put the burden on them uh, with some of these questions that we've been asking. Um, so anyway, I do continue to recommend this book. I have four or five of them at home if you're interested. I will give you one. You can keep it. Uh, it's called um, Tactics by Greg Kokel, and it is just a challenging book. I have been, I've read it twice. I read it on electronically once, and then I just finished reading it in, in, the, in the book itself. So um, it's, uh, it's been a real blessing to me, and I just wanted to share that with you. Let's be lights for Jesus uh, every day that we can. So, Okay, let's... Um, Let's take our offering. Jeremy, could you take it for us? Because we're going to do a offeratory with the trumpet trombone trio. Come on up, guys. <laughs> let's take, let's take, let's uh, ask God's blessing on our give, giving today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to give. May we give uh, in a way that's in a way with a heart of love and a heart of gratitude for all that you've done for us. You've been so good to us. We are so thankful for that and help us as we give today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 188, okay. Okay, we'll do two verses, right? One, two, three. <laughs> So can you check about check on the um, recording? Make sure it's all the both of the mics are working. Okay, we're gonna do a couple more songs. Uh, Lord Most High, let me use the remote. Yeah. Okay. 
looking for the remote. Let's see on that. Okay, this. Let me get a little bit bigger. All right, a couple more songs. Ends of the earth, the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, from the heights of the heavens, from the heights of the heavens, your name we raise, from the hearts of the weak, from the hearts of the weak, from the shouts of the strong, from the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people, from the lips of all people, your song we. Praise Lord throughout the endless ages. You have been crowned with praises, Lord Most High, exalted in every nation, sovereign of all creation, Lord Most High, be magnified. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, from the heights of the heavens, from the heights of the heavens, your, your name we raise. From the hearts of the weak, from the hearts of the weak, from the shouts of the strong, from the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people, from the lips of all people, this your song we. Praise Lord, throughout the endless ages, you have been crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in every nation, sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high, be magnified. could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience, what wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. 
Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Are we good, Sarah? Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, the book of James is over. The most practical book in the Bible we found out. Uh, it's dif- I found it difficult really preaching on it. And, and one of the reasons is because it's so practical and so straightforward. So Sarah was telling me, I, men- I mentioned this last week, that uh, she went to a service one time in the assemblies, and they're very literal in everything they do. And so one of the brothers said, well, I feel the same way. So he got up and just read the entire book and sat down. There's my message for today. You know, like uh, uh, some of the stuff, watch your tongue, be careful with your tongue. It's terrible, your tongue. It's like the world of iniquity and... uh, you know, things, just, just very, very practical, straightforward stuff. So Romans is a lot more symbolic, a lot of more thinking ahead, a lot of more lots of different doctrines being taught in a couple of sentences. So before I do that, though, some of you realized uh, that it was my 60th birthday recently. Actually, it's not yet. It's two days. So it's tomorrow, one day, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm 59 and 364 days today. So, uh, but Sarah and I were having a conversation earlier in the week, and I said, you never surprise me with gifts. You just tell me what you're going to get. And yeah, they're really wonderful gifts. I love them. But then you don't surprise me. This so She said, I'm going to get him really bad. So I had, I had three parties this week. None of them did I know about. All three of them I was surprised by. So I, I was t- talking, I think Bob or somebody, yeah, I, Bob, I feel like he said, well, you're probably three years older, right? You probably feel like you're 63 now. So I kind of feel that way right now. <laughs> no more parties for Pastor Craig. No more parties till I'm 80, I told her. So, And I don't know if I'll make that. So anyway, I'm going to be 60 in a day. And so I thought I should do some 60-year-old jokes. So here we go. Best part of being 60, 60 as you did all your stupid stuff before the Internet. Um, let's see. You know you're 60 when you're in an elevator when your favorite song comes on. You ever heard of elevator music? Yeah, I get that. Um, you know you're 60 uh, when getting lucky means a short wait in the doctor's office. You know you're 60 when your back goes out more often than you do. <laughs> um, let's see. Some of these are a little crass. I'll skip those. Um, let's see. You know you're 60 when you have a party and the neighbors don't even realize it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, oh, this one. It's not so bad. It starts out bad. But at, at 60, chasing girls refers almost exclusively, exclusively to granddaughters. Now, I don't have any granddaughters, but I'm hoping for some someday. Um, let's see. What else? There we go. The rest of them I don't want to read in public. So anyway, so I'm 60, so. All right, so turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, if you would. Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at the first part of Romans. Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 1 through 17. And let me set up PowerPoint here. We'll follow this. And uh, here we go. Romans chapter 1. And it's the book to the Romans, the believers at Rome. So uh, it was for everyone. It might have been distributed to many different groups of people, but it was for the believers. It was for the church at Rome. And who are these Romans? What are they like? What's some of their characteristics? What was the city like? Well, we know a lot about the city, don't we? We know Roman culture. Uh, Roman culture, Athens and Rome, are the Greco-Roman hotbeds of culture, of what people were like, of what was going on, what dominated uh, the people and, and the way people thought. Uh, there were many Roman soldiers in Rome, obviously, a lot of politicians, uh, because that's where the capital was. Many people who served the people that led. So even Christians might have been involved in service 
uh, related activities and professions. So many people were connected. It, you know, kind of like a Washington, D.C. kind of thing going on there. Uh, they were known for their system of gods. We know about the Roman gods, you know, uh, Apollo and just some of the different gods in the, in the uh, Greco-Roman mythological system. And, you know, uh, I think in a, in a lot of the, the discussion, uh, many of those Romans that, were, that loved this whole Roman mythology, uh, some of them may have been believers, like Apollo as a true god, but many of them weren't. Many of them, it was just the, their way of life. It had become part of their culture. It was just the way they thought. They used it in their illustrations. And, you know, like we do, even, even our own culture. People love to uh, reference the Greco-Roman gods. We have stories. We have superhero movies that involve the Greco-Roman mythology. And for them, I think, is just part of their uh, the literature, the fantasy, their thinking. Um, but to them, Caesar was the god on earth. Uh, not only was he the leader, not only was the empire leader, he was, he was like a god to many of them. They looked like Caesar like, Caesar, like a god. Uh, and anything that interfered with this faith in Caesar as the great god of the universe, I, I, I think I, I never really realized, I, I never saw this to me that impacted me so well as my favorite movie, Ben-Hur, when Masala... And, and um, uh, Ben-Hur having this conversation about the Jews versus the Romans and like he cared about his Jewish culture. And he says, no, don't need to worry. He says, the real God is, is Rome. The real God is Rome. The real God is Caesar. You know, and Caesar, I remember just making that. It just had an impact even as a small age. But that, that made up what, the, what was going on in Rome. The, the God was Caesar. These mainly Jewish Christians were, were paying the price for their faith. It got in the way of the Roman. That, and we know all the stories about Roman, uh, the, you know, the Rome, Rome's, Romans in uh, the underground of the city, the catacombs, where they would escape there. And they learned all the passageways in the catacombs. So when they were being persecuted, the Roman soldiers were coming to take them away because of their faith. They would go down in the catacombs and they knew them so well, they would, they, the Roman soldiers wouldn't come after them because the Christians knew the pathways. And, you know, you've seen the sign of the fish that was left and, you know, like that would help, the, help people if they were down there where to go. And uh, there was so many of those kinds of things going on. So these people were, it was tough to be a believer in Rome. You had to be strong in your faith. It had to be enduring faith. And some of them were worse than others. And if you were a Christian under Nero, he was just terrible. He was a tyrant and he was, he was terrible and, and just, just awful with the Christians. And uh, they may have not been visited by Paul when he went there the first time. Uh, they didn't have those, that support that they needed. Um, so this, this letter for the Roman Christians needed to be something powerful. It needed to endure. You know, and I think that's why a lot of people really feel a connection with the book of Romans in today's culture. Because it deals with some really, really, really important issues and uh, challenges us believers that take a stand. Take a stand for the values Take a stand for God's ways. And Rome, and, and this book of Romans, I think, challenges us with this. And, you know, the end of this passage, if you jump to verse 16 of Romans chapter 1, when you get to verse 16, it's that famous verse, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed. The fellowship of the unashamed is what the title of my message today is. The fellowship of the ashamed, not ashamed of the gospel. And that's what, Paul, that's what Paul's going to challenge these believers with. First of all, his greeting in verses 1 and 2. Let's follow along. Let's see where I put the mouse is right over here. So let's follow along. Uh, who are these Romans, as we mentioned? 
They were the rulers. They were religious, materialistic, proud, educated, powerful. Uh, these Romans were. Nero uh, showed that. Um, and also there's the believers, as we've just been mentioning, trying to stand, stand strong. So here's the greeting to the believers in verses 1 through 8. First of all, declaring his calling. Paul declares his calling and what he's wanting to, to challenge these believers with. Look at verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of Christ, Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul was a servant of the gospel. He was led by God to bring the gospel, to make a difference in the lives of these people. And he, in a sense, was a continuation of the Old Testament prophets. Look at Genesis 1, 2, 3. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. He's talking about the connection of the Christians to the Israeli people. And those prophets that came and said, get right with God and told them. You know, Moses is a prophet. Uh, all of those prophets in, in the Old Testament, preaching and telling people to get right with God. It takes, all, it takes us all the way back to Rome, Genesis chapter 12 as God gives blessing to the children of Israel and that prophet, that, that title of prophet continues on with people like Paul in the New Testament. He's a servant of the gospel. And, and this is, I, I, I bring this passage in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 11, because here we see the gospel in the Old Testament. Look at this. This is a great picture, a great illustration of Jesus. Look what it says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Speaking to Israel, thy, co thy king cometh unto thee, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And it will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. And, the, and that's speaking of Jesus here. And the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea, even to sea, and from the river, even to the ends of the earth. This is a passage about Jesus Christ. The prophets brought Jesus and they didn't always know it in those Old Testament prophetic passages, but they were bringing the message of a coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. And Zechariah challenges the people of Israel, there is a coming Messiah. What will he do? He will have dominion from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. He shall be the battle bow. He will fight for you. He will be the gospel. He will be the one that go to the cross and die. And so Paul, that's, he, is a, he has this connection with Israel and with the Old Testament. And he comes to declare the gospel. Look at verses 3 and 4. Concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power and according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul, here he's, he's uh, opening up to the Romans in this powerful, powerful letter. And these first four verses, first of all, he says, look, I have a connection with the prophets of the Old Testament, with Israel from the beginning. But, even more importantly, I have a connection with Jesus. I have been sent by him. And how have I been sent? I've, I've been sent to tell you about his son. Descended from David, connected to the Israeli people through the Son of David, according to the, declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of, by His resurrection. The gospel's right there. Paul starts off and he says, "Look, the gospel is paramount. The book of Romans is about the gospel. It it's a challenge to the people of Rome. Be strong. We know you're under persecution. We know it's not popular to be a." a believer in the gospel. And he says, hey, you need to hold on to it. This, the son who came, died, and was resurrected. Paul summarizes it. Came as a human, part of the Jewish royal line, died and was raised from the dead, opened the door for God's kindness to be poured out on us. That's the message that Paul is talking about here. And then he declares his mission, verses 5 through 7 through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. A challenge of encouragement. You have received the grace. 
It says, although whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience to faith, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome. This is who I'm declaring this mission to. You believers in Rome, persecuted, struggling, and I'm with you. Grace to you and peace, then he says, from God our Father and Lord. So this is the introduction. Paul's introducing. He's saying, I'm, I'm here. I'm a representative of, of God, the very God of the universe. I am a representative of Jesus as God, the Son of God, the one who came and died and was resurrected. And I'm bringing you this message and challenging you to be strong in the Lord during these difficult times that you're going through. And again, it's to all nations. This message, this book of Romans is for all of us. Yeah, it was written to those believers in Rome. But it's written to all of us. And, and, and the situation, to me, I love it because Rome is like America. It's like America. The people that turn away, the despising of Jesus and his ways, the despising of God's word and and, and the, the values that come from God's word, we just look around us and people are just, just destroying it, standing up and speaking out against it, what God's word teaches us. That's what the Romans were going through. It's exactly what they were dealing with. And then number two, Paul challenges them with his longing to go to Rome to be with them. Verses 8 through 10. Because of what he'd heard. Look what he'd heard about them. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. So these Roman believers, the example that they were showing to the other cities. You know, Rome was, again, it's like Washington, D.C. Everybody knows about it. You know, like certain things, you know, like with the news, there's always a correspondent in Washington, D.C. Watching what's going on with the president and the congressman and all of the cabinet members are there. And so people just know and hear about it. You know? And I think of a, there's a church there, uh, a Baptist church, uh, right outside the city of, um, of uh, Washington, D.C. has had a lot of notoriety. And this pastor has been so, so amazing, taking such a stand for Christ. He has come up with this, this, um, this program that he takes all over the world, the Nine Marks program, the Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And I, it's been something that's really blessed my heart, challenged me with our church and just the life of the church. Um, and he's right there in Washington, D.C., and it you know, kind of gives him a spotlight, and he's done such an amazing thing with it. You know, I kind of compare him to these Romans here. I For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking this, that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul is saying, man, I wish I could come to you right now, but I can't. So I'm writing you this letter. And you know, I'm glad Paul wrote this letter. The New Testament just can't. It needs the book of Romans. It needs these words that Paul put down. You think about it, if Paul had gone to Rome and said, I'm just going to preach this and never wrote it down, Like, we would be without some really good instruction about who Christ is. Now, it's possible Paul went to Rome again. There's controversy over if he ever went to Rome. He went to Rome on the first first or second journey. uh, And then time went by and the church grew and the church was doing what it's saying here. Uh, And then there, you know, there's, there's a teaching out there that says he went back there and then, you know, the... The church, the Christian church of today is somehow connected. I don't necessarily agree with that, but it's possible that Paul went back later. But right now he's not there, and he wishes he could go. But he says, I'm praying for you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. It's a place he wanted to be, but instead he wrote this book. The the faith of the Romans spoken of all over caused him to be a prayer warrior for them. Did Paul ever go to Rome? He he did in one of his first journeys, but uh, not at this time. Reasons for going. Why did he go? Why would, why would he go? Verses 11 through 15. For, long, for I long to see you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be aware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you. But thus far I have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, 
both to the wise and to the foolish, so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. It's very possible he went back. Uh, to give spiritual blessing is why he would want to go and, and be there or write this book. We read of incredible truth in this book. We read about all have sinned. We read about justification by faith. And in Romans 6, you know, there's, uh, he, he, he speaks about sin and, and how we are so, so terrible. We're without Christ and we need justification. And it's here in, in Romans. Justification, great explanation of sin and how to deal with it. And, and that great verse, there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Were these believers without the book of Romans? No, they weren't. They had the book of Romans. He'd be built up himself. Paul also says, look, also, not only is this book for you, but it's book for me. And he gives them that as well. Look what he, because of their walk, Paul looked forward to fellowship with them. So these Romans, these amazing believers, were also a help to Paul and encouraged him in the Lord. And that's the way it should be. No respecter of persons. Paul is not this person on high and I'm teaching you, but, but he's saying the connection I have with you is two-way, which is the way it should be in the church. And then his declaration of faith. We see Paul's declaration of faith. Unashamed, he says in verse 16. Let's look at it. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous or the just shall live by faith. And that's how Paul ends this introduction saying, look, I am not ashamed and I want to encourage you to be the same. Not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, there's times in our lives where we just feel that way for whatever reason. Maybe it's the people that are around us. People are making fun. They're looking down, you know, on the different people and friends that we have. Sometimes people just don't have a good view of Christianity. I was reading, I'm reading this book now, another, uh, another book that, Challenges, challenging my faith and, and how, to, how, to, um, how to know what you believe and say what you believe and share with others you believe. It's this pastor's wife. It's a music pastor's wife. And she talks about going into the church and um, people just being like people in the church, like the senior pastor's wife, just, just destroying her verbally for stupid little reasons. And, you know, she's just talking about it. And she's just, I was ashamed of being a Christian. And then one time she talks about bringing in someone and they're talking, talking about creation. And the guy asks some really good questions about the creation, about the age of the earth, which is controversial and difficult for some people, you know. And, and uh, you know, the church was taking the, the young earth theory, which is my view. But there's other views. And, and he was asking questions about it. And the, the t- teacher just blew him away in just just a rude way and said it just caused her to just feel ashamed of Jesus. We we go through those times. Sometimes it's with fellow believers. You know, sometimes we're with fellow believers and you look at decisions they're making or the way they treat people and you go, how do you do that? Well, they're not perfect. You know, we're sinners saved by grace. But uh, Paul here says, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God to everyone that believed, the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. I, I think that has this idea from faith to faith. It's, it's sharing. It's being accountable to each other. It's not being afraid to uplift another brother or sister in Christ when we have the opportunity to do that. And I don't think we should ever be ashamed to speak truth that's from God's Word. We should never, ever be ashamed of it. You know, get up in front of my students. You know, Jeremy had me for a semester. All these guys have. All of them have. All five of those youngsters there have had me. And um, and has, oh yeah, Maddie has me right now. So uh, like some, some yeah, I have one class where these kids have been talking. What do you think about this? You know, they talk about all these controversial issues and they want me to just like, and there's certain things because of the, the sensitive nature of it, I really feel strongly. I tell them I really feel strongly about that issue. We'll talk. If you want to talk to me about it, let's have a conversation after school. 
or in the right context, I will give you my opinion on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes you, I'm ashamed to do it, you know? Like, I don't want to talk about it for whatever reason, you know? I don't want to... I don't want to hurt feelings, or I want. But sometimes we, have, you know, we shouldn't hurt people's feelings. We should show respect in every way that we can. But at the same time, never be afraid to speak truth. You know, and I love that. I was, I, you know, I've been talking about this book, Greg Kokel. He talks about uh, instead of when you get in a conversation, you know, like on Facebook or whatever, or just just verbally, not destroy people. But he says, what I like to do is put. A rock in their shoe. He uses that all the time. Just put a rock in their shoe. So they're like, oh, man, you know, what he said made a lot of sense. You go away from that conversation. Maybe you didn't win the conversation, but you just walk away with a rock in your shoe. And then he gives testimony of, well, I I haven't won anybody to Christ, prayed with them the sinner's prayer in about 20 years, he said. Like, well, why is he? Is he not preaching the gospel? He's a minister of Christ. Why isn't he doing that? Then he said, Uh, But then he said, I've had countless people write him and say, I I got saved because of how you worked in my life. That book that you read or that question that you answered for me or when I saw you, you gave me this idea to think about and then I went home and I looked at God's word and I came to Jesus and I was saved. So there's countless people. Like he, many people have been saved because of the testimony that he had taking a stand for truth. These Romans, very hard to do. Like, persecution's coming if you do it. You better go hide out in the catacombs if you say that in public. If you meet together, you know, they had house churches, they would meet in in the dark, and, you know, it was hard to have the Word of God, and, you know, like Russian, you know, Cold War Christians, like Chinese Christians even today, meeting in the dark meeting in the dark, meeting out in in the country. It's the way it is in in China today. Believers meet in the dark. And sure, there's churches, but those churches are monitored by the government. They can't say whatever they... They can't can't teach everything that's in the Bible, those other churches that the the government monitors. But then there's those house churches in the dark. They're kind of like the Romans. Very much like the Romans. Wow. Okay, so... Um, this is Paul, uh, imprisoned, Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, smuggled out of Berea, sneered out in Athens, regarded as a fool in Corinth, stoned in Galatia. But you know what? He was of the fellowship of the unashamed. I'm going to read something to you, then I'll tell you where I found it. Uh, but this was um, written by a person who was persecuted. And I don't know if I could put myself in all of these situations. I strive to, but I don't, this is not me. But it's something that I would strive to, and I am I am I so admire uh, these words. Look what it says: I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. That's what Paul is challenging these people in Romans to be. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back. Let up. Slow down. Back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth needs. He, he just comes up with everything. You know what that means. Like that's praying. Smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by presence, learn by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I've preached, prayed, paid, stored up, stayed up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns. Give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
Because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And that's that verse in Romans. The author of this work, who was a Rwandan man in 1980, who was forced by his tribe to either renounce Christ or face certain death, he refused to renounce Christ and was killed on the spot. The night before, he had written the commitment, the fellowship of the unashamed, which was found in his room. A challenge for all of us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to be here. Um, we're thankful for the gospel, as we mentioned it earlier. What is the gospel? It's that Jesus came. It's that he came and he died. That he died for us. He died to pay the penalty for our sin. He took all of it on himself. And he went to the cross and he died. And it, it is a transforming message. And Lord, people that are saved, that are really transformed by the power of Jesus, it is a life change. It really is. Um, if it isn't, Lord, then there's questions. You have questions. And uh, maybe there's somebody who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus. They've never said, I'm, I believe. I've heard the story, but I, it's not just I'm doing it out of, you know, because, because it's cool to do. I'm doing it because I believe. Like I, I, I've seen Jesus. Like I've, I have a relationship. You're, you're getting to know him. And maybe there's someone who's never done that, really put that faith, the faith in Jesus, that he's real, that he really came to this earth. That there's, by the way, the evidence is so clear. There's, there's nobody in this world that can tell us that Jesus did not live. And there's really nobody in this world that can tell us that Jesus didn't die. Everybody agrees with it. Everybody knows that Jesus lived and he died. And then there's the resurrection, Lord. We know you're resurrected because we know you're here. We know that your presence is in our lives. And there maybe there's someone who's never done that. They've never put their faith or trust in Jesus. So if there is, I just want to give you opportunity. Just lift up your hand. I want to pray for you. And then I don't want you to leave here without talking to somebody. Maybe there's somebody. I don't know. Almost... Maybe you believe, maybe, maybe you think you believe, you're not sure possibly. If there's someone like that, just lift your hand. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, just pray for you right now and then talk to you afterwards. Anybody like that? Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, though I know all of us probably can think of somebody like that in our lives that we could make a difference in. You know, it doesn't like, necessarily bring them to church, but tell them about Jesus. Ask them about, you know, what do they think? What do they think about their life? What about heaven? What about the future? You know, where do we come from? How do we get here? You know, like there's so many things, so many ways that we can, we can make, you know, just get in to talk to people and put that stone.